Okay, so heretofore in this course, we have treated government as one of two things, either as in DeSoto's frame of reference, a guarantor of property rights, uh, or as just background, background material as with Smith, where the gravamen of Wealth of Nations and the Invisible Hand story is to encourage governments to allow free markets and free trade, but there's not much talk about governments and how they behave. And today, uh, I wanted to correct that deficiency a little by talking about government, and in particular about the government of the United States, uh, and then turning to the Viox, the Merck Viox case, uh, and looking at a little bit of video of Mark Lanier, who is the main trial lawyer litigant uh, nationally in uh, the Merck matter. Now, uh, the United States is a very unusual political system. Uh, it is a so-called presidential system, uh, often copied. There are probably, I haven't counted them, there are probably 20, perhaps 25 uh, countries with regimes that look on the surface like the American one. And they have in common that almost every one of them has failed. Almost every one of them is wildly unstable. And the organic growth of the very complex American constitutional order is, uh, is essentially unique. And it begins with uh, what I think of as the genius of the Founding Fathers expressed particularly in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51, where the object is to create a complex system, and a system which makes it hard for people to put together winning coalitions in favor of new policies, which gives enormous advantage to those defending existing policies and which by the scale and complexity of so large a system, and they thought when they began of the 13 colonies as a huge republic, and, and it was a huge republic. And what came after is, is the largest complex republic uh, the world has known, and probably uh, it is as large as is feasible uh, with a Republican form of government. The combination of federalism, so there are two major layers of government, and the expected diversity of so large a, large a country, make it hard to form majority coalitions. And even when you form majority coalitions, the system of checks and balances in the Constitution augmented by the later emergence of the committee system in the House and Senate at the federal level, uh, make putting together a winning majority very difficult. Arguably, the last presidential and congressional elections created a winning coalition for some form of health care reform, though one would have to admit that listening to the election, there wasn't much specificity about what that might be. And if you watch what's happened since, the powerful resistance to change, which is built into the system, has manifested itself. Now, from the point of view of capitalism, it is generally supposed that this is a plus, that the stability of economic policy and the endurance of, of laws relating to property, patents, um, uh, commerce, that the relative stability of all that owes something to the fact that no mere short-lived majority can transform the American political system and its policies. And I think that's broadly true. The only contingency in which one 
would fear for the American Republic. And there are people, uh, New York Times columnist Frank Rich, for example, uh, uh, New York Times columnist David Brooks, for another example, uh, who fear that we've come to that, to that difficult position. And, th and that position is this. If the existing status quo is unsustainable, as one might have thought the status quo on the regulation of banking and mortgages was uh, six months or a year ago, and as some argue the healthcare system is now, then all the checks and balances which make change difficult may make, may make it impossible to escape from that very difficult status quo. Now, I, I am a, uh, personally an optimist about the ingenuity and uh, resilience of American, the American political and economic order. But it's important right now to, to begin what we're doing today, understanding that changing public policy is uh, a heroic undertaking. The change of public policy, which will be in the background in the Vioxx case, is tort reform. And uh, part, and, and which uh, plays a huge role in the Vioxx case, tort law does, uh, and is in the background as a major factor in the healthcare reform story. Because the risk to medical practitioners, from uh, surgeons to uh, nurses, uh, that is presented by tort law is very great, and we'll try to cover some of that. Uh, using Vioxx as our case, when Vioxx was in the testing stage, I went to my internist and tried to talk him into getting me into the trial because I was still playing tennis then, and Vioxx allowed me to, Vioxx, Vioxx seemed like a miracle drug, and uh, the merit of it, a COX-2 inhibitor, was that it seemed to reduce inflammation in your joints and therefore reduce pain without creating inflammation and erosion in the intestine. Uh, aspirin and other similar drugs uh, uh, reduce inflammation in the joints but as a byproduct uh, tear at the, at the intestine. And uh, he was wise enough to say, you know, not every, not every uh, innovation is what it appears to be, and I would urge you not to be in the trials. And being a compliant fellow, I took his advice. And I, in retrospect, I guess I'm glad. Uh, <clears throat> the American system, and this is not part of the original design, has built up an enormous practice in lobbying and high-powered lawyering at the federal level. Uh, and K Street is to, is to lobbying what Wall Street uh, is to finance. And the, the existence of trade associations for every imaginable thing is a leading factor in American politics. And whomsoever would seek to control or create some new efficiency or new, new form of justice in public policy has to fight her or his way through K Street. The, and I'm about to give you a, a series of generalizations which are broadly true, each admits of exceptions, but they're about what are the advantages if we want to play the K Street game. One is concentrated interest where a particular class of individuals or companies have a lot at stake is a huge advantage. And why is it a huge advantage? Because it will provoke them to spend money on lobbying and influence. And they will have the money. Whereas dispersed interests, where there are perhaps tens of thousands or even millions of people who have some small stake in an outcome, uh, will not readily form a well-financed uh, interest association and will therefore be less strong than a concentrated uh, set of interests which form a well-financed uh, coalition. 
Uh, it goes with the second point is a truism. Uh, Well-financed causes trump poorly financed ones. And there are uh, exceptions to that, but not a lot. And remember that it is, it is a market society and money talks. It is a market society in which the First Amendment uh, gives money rights. That is, if I want to spend money putting, putting forth a point of view, and you want to regulate my right to do that, uh, my first recourse of defense for the right will be to go to the courts and say that you're infringing my right of self-expression. And the courts have often, not unambiguously, but often uh, ruled in favor of that view. Defending the status quo is a hell of a lot easier than changing it. The legislative process is full of veto points. The commonest result for legislation introduced in the House of Representatives is that it is assigned to a committee and nothing else happens. It's assigned to a committee and nobody brings it to the floor for a vote. The committee may not even hold hearings. If the chair of the committee is hostile to it, he probably hostile to it and he thinks it might have support, he will refuse to hold hearings. And, the, and th in a way that is not really the subject of this course, the succession of ways in which you can kill new legislation is uh, spectacular. Another issue, the one, of the one about agency, agency capture is a big advantage. And by this we mean that if you are in the airline business, let us say, and there is a Civil Aeronautics Bureau which is assigned the task of regulating your industry. If your industry can make an alliance with that agency itself, can capture the agency, that can be worth an enormous economic sum because it will allow you to structure public policy in a way which suits the combined interests of your industry. And something of the same is said to be at play and almost certainly is at play in the relationship between the pharmaceutical interest and the FDA. I've just said that and that in, at the same time. The CAB, Civil Aeronautics Bureau, uh, ruled the airline industry from its inception until the late 70s. And in the late 70s, it was repealed. The regime it created assigned routes to particular companies. So you would apply to the government for the right to fly from LaGuardia in Chicago to Mid uh, LaGuardia in New York to Midway in Chicago or from Midway in Chicago to LAX. And the agency would assign routes to make sure that there was not undue price competition. It would protect oligarchical pricing. And that is to say, highly profitable pricing. It would work the porter forces, if you will, to the advantage of the incumbent airlines. Uh, new entrants could be frozen out. Uh, price competition was minimal. Most of the competition had to do with amenities, most famously with um, airline attendants averaging 25 years of age and all women and none married. Um, the um, air travel business was restricted and wildly inefficient. And what killed this arrangement was the observation made by some law and economics people that the airlines which were not subject to it, and the only airlines that weren't subject to this regulation were ones which flew entirely in one state. And the most famous case was the flight between the San Francisco, Oakland area and the LA, San Diego area, where fares were low, 
uh, they were less than half comparable fares on interstate flights. Uh, a similar story in, in Texas from Love Field, Dallas, in a hub pattern around the state of Texas. Fares were lower, safety was just as good, service wasn't quite as good, but there was genuine price competition. And this group came to the fore and created a national coalition to deregulate the airlines. And the effect uh, was, well, let's take somebody at random. Who's had, how many, how many of you look forward to air travel? Somebody want to give us a 30 second essay on why it's hard to, why it's not a lot of fun to travel by air? Okay, I'll save us time. Uh, it's because flights are by and large full and the Transportation Safety Administration provides an initial indignity on each trip. Um, and because service is totally minimal, right? You have to buy your own graham crackers for lunch. The, the, uh, it's, it's not, a re unless you fly first class or business class, which Yale does not allow except for the very highest ranking officers of the university right now. Uh, uh, and then only on very long flights. Uh, air travel isn't fun at all. Uh, but what it is, is efficient. And it is in real terms vastly cheaper than it was under the regulatory regime. And I bring it up just to point out the advantage of regulation under the old CAB regime from the point of view of the airlines and not from the point of view of the passengers. The effect of deregulation was a long series of bankruptcies in which the legacy carriers uh, went broke. And those which have survived, they had gotten so fat under the old regime that they were wildly inefficient. And most of them died off and those which survived had to go through convulsive change to get their operating costs low enough to compete with the new wave carriers such as Southwest or JetBlue. Well, the FDA is, from a strategic point of view, broadly analogous to the CAB. The FDA is a huge regulatory jungle which creates uh, powerful obstacles to new entrants and which requires drug companies to be extremely well financed in order to get new products uh, through the mill. And the, the, the impact of that has been to create a relatively small number of gigantic pharmaceutical companies, uh, many of them very well run, uh, and, to, and to induce those pharmaceutical companies to aim at blockbuster drugs. Uh, Merck is one of those companies. It's, I've shown you this diagram about combining know-how with capital and motivation to get something done. And in a highly regulated environment, you've also got to worry about uh, the regulatory and legal apparatus in a big way. And these companies are really good at that. They have adapted to the regime of the F Food and Drug Administration and are uh, terrifically good at that. And they are able to uh, put up pretty high barriers to competition from new entrants. And the typical outcome for somebody, for a small firm, which has a drug candidate, is that they get to a certain stage in the preliminary phases of testing and then sell or license the drug to one of the major pharmaceuticals. Um, I'll post this slide. It's the, it's the history of 
Merck's, Merck's interaction with government and government's road toward the FDA. The interesting thing, it's in the case about Merck, is that its property was seized during World War I. And for the American government to seize the property of a corporation is a very rare event. But the problem was, of course, World War I, the Germans were the bad guys. They ended up having to buy their property back on loans from Wall Street. And the reason they got the loans is that Merck was a great company, a great company with centuries of history. Um, the two legislative acts which are perhaps important to the background of this case are the Prescription Drug User Fee Act and of 92 and the FDA Modernization Act of 97, both of which gave put the drug companies in the position of funding the FDA's investigation of uh, their proposals. Now, in looking for a blockbuster drug, uh, think of the green square as a space representing all the possible diseases that drugs could fix. And they range on the vertical scale from acute at the bottom to chronic on the top from rare on the bottom to common on the right. I said chronic up here, or I meant chronic up here. And is it obvious to you where the money is to be made in the pharmaceuticals business? Yes, back left. Pardon? Common and chronic. Common and chronic. Because if acute, the customer may not stay alive long enough to be truly profitable. And common, is, uh, has its obvious uh, benefit. So the idea of a COX-2 inhibitor, the business plan behind a COX-2 inhibitor, was to advertise the hell out of it and to capture a huge uh, generation of uh, people 40 and older uh, with bad knees, tennis elbow, all those stiff necks, all those things which go on for decades. Uh, and during the 17-year patent to make billions upon billions of dollars. And blockbuster drugs, in fact, do make billions upon billions of dollars. And there is a market failure problem with this model, which has to do with less common, with less common and more acute diseases. And many, many small, small disease populations get disproportionately small investment in drug research because of the logic of blockbuster drugs. Uh, Merck uh, has had two really famous CEOs in recent times. This is Roy, Va I've had both these guys in my classroom to teach this case at one time or another. Uh, Roy Vangelos was a, uh, is an MD and a brilliant MD and, a, and an idealist. He, at one point, I don't know if, the, is, is the river blindness drug in this case? Yeah, the river blindness drug is one where he, the government wouldn't pay to, fe pay to distribute the drug uh, in Africa, but he just had Merck pay and thinks he got his money back in the motivation of his research staff. And Ray Gil Martin, who succeeded him, and comes in for great abuse in the Mark Lanier video we'll look at. Uh, Ray Gil Martin w is an MBA, uh, worse yet, a Harvard MBA, and was a uh, hell for leather marketer. And he looked at the COX-2 inhibitor market as the best single market uh, available in the generation to Merck and put a huge sales force out there and went uh, full stop and sometimes a little over the line with the ethics of inducing doctors to prescribe the drug. Uh, sometimes by uh, straightforward favor given, giving, sometimes by uh, invitation to so-called research conferences which were in actual fact uh, golfing holidays of the kind now, what's wrong with a golfing holiday aimed at MDs if we remember Sharon Oster? Do we remember? Yes. Yes. Can we, can we, can we throw him a mic?
I remember correctly, what you said was that if the doctor was willing to go on a golfing holiday, that means the opportunity cost he's losing is not that high. So it's probably not a, well, a doctor that sees a lot. Okay, so the doctors with the lowest opportunity cost for going to Hawaii go to Hawaii, and they're not the people you're trying to reach. And that's certainly true of, of the heart technology. Maybe a little less true of Vioxx, where a very low-key practice where you just, just casually advise people to take this drug uh, would be very valuable. The common law tradition. Um, the English common law uh, is derived not from legislation but from cases and builds up through precedent where each new case is analyzed by its analogy or lack thereof uh, to earlier cases which raised the same legal issues. And this tradition goes back a thousand years or nearly a thousand years and uh, came to the United States with the immigrants who came to New England uh, in the 17th century and is uh, a dominant part of the American legal code which is largely separable from Congress and the legislative process. And central to it is the idea that courts should make the victims of, of uh, careless, reckless, or fraudulent uh, products uh, whole, should make them, should bring them back to a situation as good as they would have been, been in if they had not uh, received the bad product. And beyond that, often punitive damages, where if we say this person was harmed to the extent of $100,000, so we pay him the $100,000 at the expense of the company, but we then say this is a huge company. $100,000 means nothing to this company. So let's say $100 million. And most of the $100 million is punitive damage, which nonetheless goes to the victim, but is meant to teach the company a lesson. Well, from the point of view of business, punitive damages are very scary. And the American legal landscape is a particularly complex one for that reason, because with federalism, Gen versus Rich, you remember it. Gen versus Rich is about tort law and about setting incentives in a way that works well for society as a whole. And the problem with Merck Vioxx is similarly that. I'll give you one more, uh, one more uh, common law case to get the feel of this. Uh, at the close of World War II, the guy who owned this property near an airport sued the airport for the noise of planes going through his airspace. He said, I own the airspace. They can only come through if they have my permission or pay me rent on the use of my airspace. And uh, the plaintiff had a very strong common law precedent. The common law theory of airspace was that you make a projection from the, after people were sure the world was round, it's a, it's a uh, spherical projection, uh, to the ends of, ends of the universe, you own everything that is in that spherical projection over your land. Now, you were, uh, you're a judge. It's 1947. The airline industry is just getting strong. And you're presented with this case. Tal, how would you decide it? Can we? Thanks, Nancy. If I let, 
it would obviously be very difficult to in let the airline industry form if I let every single person who owns property uh, control the airspace or over their property, because then they'd have to, tran the transaction costs would be used to negotiate with each and every single person. Absolutely. That's, that nails the question. So a flight, a little flight from Chicago to Milwaukee or from Milwaukee to Madison, Wisconsin, or from Madison, Wisconsin to Minneapolis would involve thousands of transactions and license fees with the owners of all the land you're going to traverse. And the airline industry would be stillborn for that reason. So in the background of this case, just as in the background of Gen versus Rich, is creating incentives for those who are prepared to invest in the generation of value and ultimately of wealth for the society as a whole. And, and uh, Mr. Justice Douglas in May of 1946 wrote the opinion in U.S. versus Cosby, which uh, decided the case uh, in favor of the airlines and against uh, the landowners. Now, the plaintiff bar. Now, let's not do the summary settlement. Let's see if I can remember how we're going to do this. DVD stage. Play. This is a set of interviews we sent. I think Mark ultimately has to settle. This is Mark um, Maybe not all of the cases, but Mark certainly needs to settle the good cases. Uh, what, what Mark needs to do is wait until the statute of limitations runs. What that means is that there's a time period after you're damaged where you have to file your lawsuit. And if you don't file within that time period, your, your rights are gone. Merck needs to go ahead and wait and let that time period run so that, that there is a, a, a fixed denominator. How many cases are out there? And then the numerator, how many of those is Merck going to settle, can be determined. And I'm not sure that Merck needs to settle every case out there. Uh, these cases are expensive to fight and they're hard to fight. And so, so Merck can satisfactorily settle the difficult uh, uh, cases of serious injury where really I think all of us ultimately agree Merck owes the money. And then Merck can take those cases of lesser liability and, and ultimately tell the lawyers, you want us, come get us. And, and that's where this has got to end up, I think. I think there are probably about 25 to 30,000 cases that ultimately will be filed against Merck. Uh, out of those 25 to 30,000, how many of them are good cases? I would guess probably s you, you've got different degradations of good. It's like students. You know, there's A good and there's B good. Then there's C not so good. And then there's D and F really not good at all. Um, uh, how many A, B cases in that grouping? Uh, over half of them, I think, are probably A, B cases. How many of those are C's? Eh, maybe a third. How many of them are D and F? Eh, maybe about 25%. I don't know. Now, my percentages may not add up, uh, but uh, it's something in those ranges, at least. <laughs> my guess is 12 to $15 billion for our liability for Merck. Um, I, I think if Ken Frazier, the general counsel for Merck, came to me and said, Lanier, Here's twelve and a half billion dollars. Make my headache go away. I could come pretty close to to resolving all of his issues. There's a great deal of difficulty uh, in in trying to set up a jurisdiction for hearing these cases. Uh, the way the law is set up, philosophically, the plaintiff who has a burden of proof, the plaintiff has to prove their case. A tie goes to the defendant, if you will. The plaintiff with a burden of proof is supposed to get a pick of forum. By that it means if you've got to prove your case, you should be allowed to choose in which court you want to do it. Realistically, in America, all of our courts are supposed to be fair. But practically, we recognize that some are more plaintiff friendly and some are more defense friendly. And so uh, the plaintiffs naturally try to find those courts that are plaintiff friendly the defendants want defense-friendly uh, courts. Uh, we tried the first case in Texas. Texas has a reputation for being plaintiff-friendly, 
Realistically, I think at this point in time, it's probably not. Our judge was appointed to the bench by George Bush when he was governor of Texas. George Bush, uh, President Bush, is certainly uh, no friend to trial lawyers. Um, uh, we have an appellate court system in Texas that is entirely Republican. Uh, there will not be a Democratic judge that will ever see the, the Vioxx case we have. Uh, uh, we tried in Texas, or the ones pending right now, to my knowledge. Um, in New Jersey, you've got a different scenario. Uh, you've got a court system that's very friendly, uh, ideologically at least, with Big Pharma. Pharma has a home in New Jersey, has great tort reform in New Jersey, and until we got the punitive damage finding against Merck, had never been uh, held responsible for punitive damages in New Jersey under the current state of the law. If you Google uh, judicial hellhole, uh, you will find a map showing the most plaintiff-friendly jurisdictions in the country. And the huge ideological battle and political battle, which is in progress, about federalizing and capping uh, tort law awards uh, is out there. Just, just go tort reform or judicial hell holes and you'll get the flavor of it. So uh, New Jersey is somewhere that I think Merck would like. I'm going to skip a good bit here. Sorry. This is fairly the, the The Harvard Business School slide that I put. Uh, was not the first slide I showed, but it certainly was uh, in my opening statement. Uh, I, I wanted the jury to understand that when, uh, b before Ray Gil Martin came on board, Merck, which was 1994, Merck was run basically by a CEO named Dr. Vaj Vagelos, and, and Dr. Vagelos is a world-renowned doctor, phenomenal doctor. When Ray Gil Martin came on board, Merck didn't hire a world-renowned doctor to run the company. Uh, Merck didn't hire a world-renowned chemist or even a nationally known chemist. A heck, I'd have taken a local chemist. <laughs> they didn't hire a pharmacist, uh, someone who had experience with pills and medicines uh, on, on even a local level, much less a national level. What Merck did is they took a, a different uh, direction. They changed directions from the Vagelos days, Dr. Vagelos days, and they hired an MBA, uh, which I have a lot of respect for MBAs, but I think we need to put into context what it was speaking to within the Merck culture. It was saying no longer is science running our company. We're now going to run this company along economic terms as a business. And Ray Gil Martin came in as a Harvard-trained MBA who had really no science background whatsoever. And, and it was an, I, I put the Harvard Business School slide up to, to put a visual image to go with the intellectual concept that Merck was choosing to be a business first company, not a patient. When we tried the Ernst case, I was stunned at the opening that Merck gave. Understand Bob Ernst died from what's called sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death means you are dead by the time you're in the hospital and the cause is, is not something they can easily trace, but it's clearly a heart problem. Uh, the sudden cardiac death was attributed to an arrhythmia, which is a ventricular fibrillation for him. His, his heart was quivering. And the question ultimately becomes what caused that heart quivering arrhythmia uh, most typically, according to the Merck Manual, it's caused by a heart attack. Uh, but it can be caused by an electrocution. It can be caused by uh, inhaling a lot of salt water and a drowning. And it can be caused by uh, 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 being exposed to, to hyperthermia. Um, clearly, none of those is what had happened to Bob Ernst. Bob Ernst uh, had had a heart attack. I was stunned in opening when the Merck lawyer stood up and told the jury, disingenuously I believe, 
that if the jury looked at the coroner's report, they would see that the coroner said uh, Bob Ernst had not had a heart attack. Bob Ernst had died from arrhythmia, secondary to atherosclerosis. Well, those are both caused by a heart attack. Uh, uh, you, you, it, it, you know, someone may have died from a loss of blood, okay, but if someone was shot and it was the gunshot that caused the bleeding and the loss of blood, it's disingenuous to stand up and tell a jury, oh, they didn't die from the bullet, they died from loss of blood. <laughs> and so I was shocked by that because I thought it was a misrepresentation. And I think Merck did it thinking they could get away with it because no one had ever been able to find the coroner and ask her what she meant. And so I, I don't have any testimony to the contrary. We just have a report. So I went back to my office and I said, I want the coroner. And they said, we can't find the coroner. I said, we can find anybody except bin Laden. Find the coroner. <laughs> we hired a couple of PIs. We found the coroner doing uh, pathology work in the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi. Uh, I shot her an email asking her if she would mind if I spoke with her. She emailed back and said she'd be glad to speak with me. I called her on the phone and I said, here is what was said about this case in opening. Here is what your autopsy said. Tell me about it. She said, well, he died you know, under an autopsy. I have to put the physical cause. The physical cause, it was a sudden cardiac death with an arrhythmia secondary to atherosclerosis. I said, well, how does that kill you? And she said, easy, you have a heart attack. I said, really? She said, of course. That's the only thing that causes it. Atherosclerosis causes a heart attack. The heart attack causes an arrhythmia. She said, unless he was electrocuted. And she said, was he electrocuted? And I said, no. She said, okay. I said, would you come over and explain that to the jury? She said, I'd be glad to. So she came over. Well, Merck threw a fit because Merck says we never would have told the jury what we did if we'd known Lanier was going to be allowed to tell the truth about it. So uh, 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 that's a, that film is almost an hour long. We had it, we had it made for the MBAs uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Mary Pat, uh, you're not the coroner, uh, but if I asked you, is there a, is there another set of relationships that involve Merck? that were uh, behind the scenes in all this and, and what you know about them, help me out. Sure, um, well in addition to all the plaintiffs um, who brought cases against Merck, Merck also had taken out insurance policies for product liability and um, liability exposure insurance and they took them from a bunch of companies like Munich Reinsurance and at the same time that all these cases were going on Merck was trying to collect on those policies. Um, basically, they wanted money because they had to pull Vioxx and <coughs> all the exposure. Um, they were losing a lot of money in profits that way. But um, these insurance companies were saying, well, you ex are exercising a breach of warranty because when you took out these policies, you basically told us that you know this sort of a thing wouldn't happen, but we're saying that you knew something like this would happen. OK. and. Uh, did the company your close relative represented end up paying or not? Um, they paid some of the damages, but not all. Some sort of a negotiated settlement. Yeah. Now, let's see. I'm not getting my images back and we'll do without them. Uh, let me finish this. Uh, the uh, ultimate outcome was a negotiated settlement uh, amounting not to 12 and a half billion dollars as uh, Mark Lanier thought or claimed to think, uh, but uh, 4.85 billion. And what, what happens is the court system creates a class action suit and then settles the class action suit in a way which creates a scoring system for the plaintiffs, the tens of thousands of plaintiffs. And you, uh, the score you get depends on how long you use the drug uh, and how severely you suffered and how plausible the causal connection between what happened to you and the drug is. For example, if you took uh, Vioxx for a short period of time but were a 280 pound diabetic uh, with a 
major smoking problem and a quarter day bourbon problem, <laughs> uh, the odds were that you weren't going to get a lot of money out of the settlement. So it's a mechanical system. And I personally believe that when used within reasonable limits, common law is a way of protecting relatively small people against large companies. And the adjudication of that boundary, which is now in progress, is very important. The killer for large companies is the, tr the transaction costs of settling uh, so many cases uh, can themselves be prohibitive. Okay, exam on Wednesday and uh, back to work on Monday.